From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The 37th Assembly of the African Union Summit has just ended in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. This gathering brought together leaders from across the continent, providing a crucial platform for dialogue, collaboration and exploration of new paths. The agenda covered a spectrum as diverse as the African continent itself, addressing peace, development and of course the ever-pressing matter of security. How might the outcomes of this summit reshape the organization's policies and what lies ahead? For the nations of Africa. To shed light on the just concluded summit, we're honored to be joined by Erastus Mwancha, former Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Mr. Mwancha, welcome back to the Hub. Thank you very much. Chairman Mwancha, what were the key priorities that took center stage at this year's African Union Summit and why do you think they're important to Africa now and to the future of Africa? The seventh summit that has just ended here in Addis Ababa, of course, it discusses many items being an annual meeting of heads of state and government. Uh, but this summit here focused on some key areas, uh, of course, which was under the theme of education. But as you would expect, it also featured uh, on peace and security. It looked at uh, the progress that is ma being made in the area of trade. It looked at the aspect of climate change and the impact it's having, uh, the issues of uh, global financial architecture, and uh, it was, uh, I would say, overall a very successful summit. Also, there is the new um, chairperson of the African Union, Mohamed al Ghazouani. The president of Mauritania has been elected as the new chairperson of AU uh, going forward. Um, do you expect largely a consistency and continuity of policy of the AU? What potential transformations uh, do you anticipate in the dynamics of the AU and this engagement with external partners? Uh, I, we, no one expects a major change. Africa's dialogue with uh, development partners, global external partners, is already cast in a very clear uh, you know, terms. And so this will be a continuation. And it's not the first time that Mauritania is assuming chairmanship of the union. Just about less than 10 years ago, Mauritania was uh, leading and uh, that consistency was uh, underlined during that time. During the summit, AU leaders condemned uh, Israel's offensive in Gaza and calls for its immediate end. Uh, how does the conflict outside the continent uh, resonate with Africa, particularly concerning the situation in Gaza? Um, we've known that uh, a number of Security Council resolutions um, on a ceasefire could not be um, reached because some country uh, rejected this ceasefire resolution. How do you look at all this? The African Union has always had the solidarity with the Palestinians. And uh, in fact, the Palestinian leader was here and they spoke at the summit. Beyond that, as you rightly mentioned, yes, there was condemnation uh, for the humanitarian crisis that is there. And uh, the leaders here, of course, like uh, the rest of the world, as uh, condemned the, the, the what you might call uh, injustice committed at mass level. Innocent Palestinians being killed. The leaders, of course, expressed uh, anxiety that invasion of Afar should be really discouraged and stopped uh, so that there is humanitarian assistance and go back to finding a political solution, which Africa has always said that a two-state solution is the only way forward. How do you envision the future trajectory of this pan-Africanism? Do you believe that uh, the prospect of a new Africa beyond borders and boundaries and you know, differences is becoming uh, a reality at some point? Pan-Africanism is what informed independence for African states. And the Pan-Africanism continues to uh, be a spirit that uh, really enjoins Africans to work together for the common emancipation of the Africans wherever they are. Uh, so Africa is uh, saying we must not forget the journey of a united Africa. And uh, this is, of course, being discussed under uh, Africa trying to create uh, a large market uh, so that Africa can be able to transform its economies. That is the underlying factor of Pan-Africanism. Yeah, Chairman Mwancha, uh, last Saturday, Chinese President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory message to the 37th African Union Summit. 
President Xi Jinping stressed that over the past year, China-Africa relations have grown substantially. Uh, how would you assess the current state of China-Africa relations overall, and uh, what key areas do you see for further collaboration to deepen these ties? Very well received, and don't forget that uh, late in the year, there is going to be the FOCAC summit, and uh, preparation is already underway for that meeting to take place. And that meeting has always uh, uh, engendered very good spirit within the cooperation of Africa-China cooperation. And uh, China-Africa is already very settled and uh, very well in prep. And uh, it has always been a source of uh, uh, identifying priorities, modalities of cooperation. And so many leaders will always look forward uh, to meeting again, particularly with the presence of President Xi Jinping, to chart out the way forward especially looking at the key issues now facing the world, uh, economic uh, distress, uh, global ch climate change, uh, and of course uh, what we are seeing as protectionism that is hurting the world. Across the continent, however, in the recent uh, years, we've seen resurgence of military coups, pre- and post-election violence, uh, humanitarian crises linked to war and the effects of climate change, as you mentioned. How do you perceive the role of African Union uh, and this summit in particular in addressing critical issues in Africa and fostering unity, which many consider is long overdue. As you would expect, the matters of peace and security still occupy the center stage at the summit uh, besides education, which was the theme. And of course, of concern, as you have rightly mentioned, is the unconstitutional change, which is informed by, you know, uh, democracy receding in a number of countries and a number of countries that uh, have had unsuccessful elections or call it elections that were disputed. But largely, this is really, again, a matter that has uh, exercised the minds of the leaders to say, let's go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves where things are not working well, uh, which I think to me points in the right direction because uh, other than condemning and constitutional, but there is also a question that is being asked, why now and why at this scale, when there was a lull for many years from 2001 to almost 2019 when we started to see this. In 2024, more than 20 new countries are expected to join the you know, existing seven in the Guided Trade Initiative. How do you see this free trade area of Africa coming along? That is one of the highlights of this summit. It was discussed and, of course, uh, noting progress that has been made, particularly in preparing the various protocols. Uh, one of the protocols that was unveiled here is a digital trade, which was very well received. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, the guided trade was done under five countries, for five countries in 2023. It was largely successful. There were lessons learned from it and expanding it. But of course, the intention is not to continue on this guided trade. It's when this process of trade making is finished, uh, this is really like proof of concept that is being undertaken. The, the idea is then to embark on uh, all Africa trade uh, under the preferential arrangements that have been agreed upon with the protocols that have already been uh, uh, accessed to, acceded to by member states, and, and of course, moving to. Uh, customs union and the rest down the road. What do you identify as the major barriers for this African continent free trade area uh, from becoming a, a reality? I mean, there are different customs, different uh, access uh, standards, and uh, different uh, stages of development concerning different African countries. And many would consider that um, it could be a tall order for this um, African free trade area to be a reality in the foreseeable future. But how do you look at this? You mentioned uh, rightly a number of them, like standards and the rest. But to me, the key one is uh, infrastructure. If you look at Africa, the continent, the mass uh, uh, land that is there, uh, the development of infrastructure that can allow movement of goods uh, from one part of Africa to the other is hampered by many obstacles. And uh, during the guided trade, this came out very well. For instance, if you look at products which were sent, say, from South Africa to Tunisia, uh, you have to use sea 
which is not so much of a difficult. But if you think of sending goods from Kenya, say, to Ghana, you have to go around uh, Europe or, you know, South Africa because there is no link. And so infrastructure is key. Uh, apart from infrastructure, uh, you really need uh, transformed, uh, you know, products because Africa at the moment is largely trading in uh, rock and dust uh, because that's what Africa exports to uh, the rest of the world. This cannot be exported to Africa. If you add value to this, because these same products which come from exported rock and dust out of Africa come to Africa as finished goods and at exorbitant prices. This is where Africa is also aiming to go. In other words, to produce value-added products. And of course, China has been a strong partner in you know, working with Africa in delivering some of these infrastructure projects. Some are you know, mutually beneficial for some um, are not without their you know, questions and doubts. Uh, but overall, uh, how do you expect this China-Africa partnership to continue to deliver infrastructure-wise, uh, be it hard infrastructure like roads, bridges, and ports and airports, uh, and also the unconventional infrastructure, be it uh, mobile payment systems, um, so on and so forth? This is key. And as you rightly mentioned, if you look at where China's uh, uh, worked with Africa to develop this infrastructure. Uh, if you look at the rail, uh, whether it is the Mombasa, Kigali rail, uh, if you look at the Southern Africa uh, corridor, you look at the Northern Africa aspect, uh, the Djibouti, this is helping to reduce cost and time of doing business. And this is precisely the key aspect. Uh, but as you mentioned, infrastructure is a key in that area. In addition to that, of course, Africa needs now to look at how do you facilitate trade because uh, uh, the currencies become a hindrance, especially you know, if you have to organize payments from one country to the other. The payments go via outside Africa, and it costs money, it costs time. That aspect is being worked on, and there's a project that is being supported by Flexing Bank and the rest. Uh, and in addition to that, of course, uh, trying to make sure that you have tradables, goods that can be traded upon. What is your forecast uh, when it comes to Africa? Uh, of course, Africa is not this monolithic hoe, but uh, let's say the, the, the more ad, uh, developed part of Africa, uh, first of all, moving up the value chain, you know, stopping being this exporter of raw materials only, but really having these raw materials processed and industrialized in Africa and selling to the outside world higher value-added goods. Yes, you are starting to see a number of uh, projects that are being implemented in Africa. For instance, uh, we, you can now access uh, fertilizer that is produced in Africa, which is a key uh, intermediate product for uh, the development of agriculture. A number of uh, uh, machineries are now being assembled in Africa. Africa is really very keen to start uh, adding value to some of uh, the key raw materials, particularly for greening the economy under climate change. As you know, Africa is home to a number of what you might call green minerals and all that. So the conversation is now for partnerships and uh, looking out for uh, the friendly countries that uh, would join Africa in uh, add value to these minerals which go out as rock and dust. Yeah, finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me ask you about education because 2024 is actually designated by the African Union as a year of education. But we know that there are um, multiple challenges. And you yourself admitted that, quote unquote, despite our collective efforts and progress, a shocking nine out of 10 kids in Africa struggle to read and comprehend a simple text by the age of 10. This isn't just a statistic. It symbolizes millions of deferred dreams, countless untapped potentials, and a compromised future. Um, can you tell us a bit about Africa's learning crisis and how do you see them being addressed? This is, of course, a, a subject that took uh, center stage and is going to be a theme for the rest of the year. And in the run-up to the summit, a number of sessions were held to look at what affects education in Africa. Uh, right from, uh, if you look at the number of children in Africa uh, that are school-going age, from say age five to 19, is about that 5% of Africa's population. And each of that child that should be going to school uh, in the global standards 
uh, in terms of per capita cost of educating that child, Africa is not spending enough. And that is because Africa has challenges in terms of debt repayment and in uh, competing challenges. In, and But also, uh, Africa is not able to put all these children who should be going to school to be in school. In other words, if you look at, for instance, the number of kids that complete, uh, say, uh, primary education uh, is just about 60%. Now, where do the 40% go? That is key because you don't have enough capacities in secondary and post-secondary for them to be able to uh, advance and become, uh, you know, uh, proficient in some of the areas that they aspire to be, to become doctors, engineers, and the rest. If a kid is not able to be literate and enumerate, in other words, be able to read differently and be able to understand some of the numerical activities by age 10, it means they'll miss out in education for the rest of their life. And as you mentioned, it's a very small percentage that acquire that. And why is that? It has to do with uh, teacher-student ratio, the quality of the environment, uh, kids being given good pedagogy, how you teach it and what you teach. So there is a lot uh, push to try and heighten this because uh, if you look down the, the decades to come, Africa is going to be a major supply of uh, labor, but that has to be quality labor, well-educated and well-grounded. Uh, At the moment, Africa is losing its uh, asset in terms of the human capital because of uh, inadequacy of education. So funding, particularly uh, looking at the budget, at least spending 20% of the national budget on education. But of course, you look at the competing needs of these countries, including debt repayment. At the moment, if you look at debt repayment in some of the countries going up to about 70% of uh, the national budget, how are you going then to be able to spend 20%? These are critical issues and uh, one that is yet really to find what, what one would call a lasting solution. Yeah, hopefully um, your advice will be heeded and those aspirations will become a reality soon for our friends in Africa, of course, across the world. Um, in China, we're uh, trying very hard to, to put the countryside in, on par with the developed areas of China. The urbanization is going on in earnest. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Aristus Moancha, former Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Thank you for coming back on The Hub. Thank you so much for having me.